If you're not spending time on Minecraft and Roblox, you really probably aren't seeing where influencer marketing is going. I had no idea that you were a gaming nerd as well. I got a, I, like, we got some Pokemon. Wow, okay. I have the Snorlax. I got some Pac-Man. There's some Pac-Man. <laughs> What is the worst tech trend that you're seeing which is going on right now? I love AI. I'm a huge proponent of it as a way to help creators become better at what they do, maybe become creators that they didn't think they could. But the idea that AI is just do everything, shove it all in there and it'll just create your posts and do everything for you, I'm not a fan of that. Do you think AI tools will be more like collaborators or competitors for human creators? Uh, I think it's going to be both. I see a world where there is so much artificial content flooding our platforms that it may be difficult for us to find content that's not. I also see it as a great way for people who may want to be a creator but just don't have the creative power to do certain things to allow them to do it. So I think we're going to see a lot more creators come into the fold. It is both empowering, it is a tool, and it is a way to help creators, but it also has the ability to generate so much junk that real creators may get buried. Beyond follower count, what are some of the key factors creators should focus on to build a lasting and authentic brand? You know, focus on who you are and what you like. I mean, follower count is almost not even relevant anymore. I mean, it's totally relevant, but there are other things like how many known fans do you have? How many fans of yours do you know? Do you have direct mm. connection to? Can you market directly to? Whether it's through email address or mobile number or whatever. What kind of content are you making that you like? How is that resonating with people? How are you enjoying it? Because in the end, if you're not enjoying the content creator journey, it's gonna drive you crazy and you're gonna have mental health issues. So all of those things I think are important. One, two. Welcome everyone to season two of Impulse, the influencer marketing podcast. I'm your host, Shubham Tiwari, head of content and socials at Philo, the universal API for creator data. Our guest today is none other than Jim Lauderback. Jim isn't just a name. He's a bridge between the OG days of TV and the thriving world of influencer marketing now. Jim's career has been a masterclass in uh, media evolution for over three decades uh, before becoming a pioneer at Revision 3. Jim had already worked at big name media companies, then went on to conquer the digital realm at Discovery Digital Networks. But Jim's story continues. He captained and championed uh, VidCon, the world's biggest creator gathering for eight years, proving his understanding of the creator economy before it even had a name. Uh, now he keeps creators and influencers at the forefront of our minds through his highly successful newsletter, Inside the Creator Economy. It has more than 22,000 readers weekly. They get the newsletter. I'm one of them. <laughs> uh, so get ready for some insightful conversation about where influencers are headed and uh, where Jim is headed. So first of all, let's welcome Jim. Uh, Jim, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me on. It's like to be here. So yeah, we always start with, you know, one fun question. Uh, please give us your most controversial hot take on influencer marketing. Uh, if you're not spending time on Minecraft and Roblox, you really probably aren't seeing where influencer marketing is going. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So let's also, let's take some more fun questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a rapid fire sort, uh, sort of questionnaires. Uh, so which is your favorite tech gadget? Favorite tech gadget depends on what day it is. But uh, given that I just drove back from a meeting in San Francisco, I live about 20 miles south, and my Tesla basically self-drove me there and back. My favorite tech gadget right now is my Tesla. But uh, I'm also a fan of, uh, of this, which is my Pixel. There we go, my Pixel 9 or 8 Pro, not 9 yet because it takes really good pictures and I use it. I don't need to bring a big camera with me and I can basically create video from anywhere. And um, the other one that I basically spend a lot of time with, more time than with probably anything but a computer, is my Switch. So um, just in the middle of Thousand Year Door right now, the remake wow. from the version on the GameCube that I played when it was a GameCube. And uh, just, yeah, those are, those are sort of my three faves at this point. Well, I had no idea that you were a gaming nerd as well. Otherwise, I would have, you know. Oh, come wait, prepared. A minute, wait a minute. I got, I got a, I, like, we got, we got some Pokemon. Wow. Okay. That'll help you out. What else we got? Uh, um, oh yeah, we gotta have, gotta, gotta have the Snorlax come in. Maybe we'll just have wow. the Snorlax okay. sit here while we. We sleep. all no, need I to am, take I, inspiration. I don't have any. Oh wait, 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 wait! I got some Pac-Man. There's some Pac-Man. <laughs> uh, what else have I got up on my shelves? 
don't think I have anything uh, Zelda wow. esque. But uh, anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. But yes, I'm a gamer. See, this interview could have gone in a very different direction based on. <laughs> <laughs> it still can. <laughs> Great. But let's focus on creators. Uh, who's your favorite creator? You can give us an all-time figure as well as someone you are, you know, really big on. Well, it's, right it's, it's, always, it's always different. It's a broad mix. Um, if you think about it from all time, I mean, Hank and John Green, just the, the Vlog Brothers, just because I've had the honor to work oh, for yeah. them, then they worked for me. Um, we worked together. Uh, I was big fans of them when they came out. So they're sort of the all-time you know, when you think about creators these days, I really love what Alyssa McKay is doing. Uh, she's really building a great name for herself across TikTok and Snap and other places, building really good products. I think that's really fun to watch. And then on the engineering side, look, Michael Reeves, Mark Rover, uh, William Osman, those engineering creators, I think, are so amazing in what they do. I mean, they may not produce a lot of content, but everything they do is must watch. So I guess that's a couple for you. Wonderful. What is the worst tech trend that you're see that you're seeing, which is going on right now? The worst tech trend. Um, I think the the worst tech trend is people thinking that AI is going to save everybody and do everything for you. I love AI. I'm a huge proponent of it as a way to help creators become better at what they do. Maybe become creators if they didn't think they could. But the idea that AI is just do everything, shove it all in there, and it'll just create your posts and do everything for you. I'm not a fan of that. Cool. Uh, who's your dream dinner guest, tech or creator, anyone? Dream dream guest for dinner? Yep. Um, you know, that's a, that's a tough one. I got to say, because there's so many different ones out there. I think it'd be really fun to have dinner with Rhett and Link. <laughs> but I don't think I want to eat what they're eating. <laughs> Okay, I'll have to, you know, actually go out and check who's this creator. Which oh, Rhett here. and Link, Good Mythical Morning. Come on. Uh, they're OG in the space. They're amazing, but you definitely, like, they do some crazy stuff with food that I do not want to get near. <laughs> Please pardon my ignorance. Uh, let's move no, no, to the next okay. question. <laughs> now you got something to check out. And once you do, you'll be yeah. like, oh, my God, I'm going to watch these guys for the next week. Absolutely. Uh, if you could have any superpower for content creation, what would it be? I would love to take all the video that I've shot and the voiceovers, shove it in a box and have it come out with a beautifully rendered, edited thing so I wouldn't have to do any of the editing. Now, I'm, I am used a script and now I can actually edit and it's decent and fast. And I don't have to but I just want that black box, shove it in, masterpiece comes out and I can move on. I'm good at being in front of the camera and talking and shooting stuff, eh, okay, but editing is like, oh, what a slog. Great. Uh, a lot of AI tools nowadays are, you know, claiming to have magical powers to produce wonderful content. So that's another thing thing to think about. Yeah, Descript does a really good job, but I really yep. like what they've done, where they're going. Um, and there are others out there I should probably try, but, it, but it's, it's a lot better now than it was. Yeah, of course. Uh, speaking about what's better now and what's what's not, uh, early days, of course, because uh, you are in media for a long, long time. So what initially drew you to the world of technology and media? Did you have any early content creation experiences? Did you write blogs, podcasts, something like that, that shaped your career path? I, I was a geek. Um, I was uh, uh, really into computers, into games, into early days of PCs, building my own PC, uh, building computer systems. I was a programmer, built databases for companies. Uh, and, you know, just really love the PC world where anybody could have a computer. So that's how I got started. And um, so I fell into media because I started writing about the databases I was building. And so the methodology stuff and ended up getting a couple of stories in popular magazines. And I um, answered an ad in the New York Times to be lab director at one of my favorite computer uh, magazines, PC Week, weekly for the industry. Never thought they'd give me the job as lab director running reviews, and they did. And so that's how I fell into first writing about it and reviewing and doing all that. And then we started to get into photos and video. We started a cable network called Tech TV, ZDTV, that I came out and ran content on and hosted a show called Fresh Gear. So all those are sort of my early lean-ins into media and into video. But I kind of fell into it just because I was a geek and I started writing about what I loved. Wonderful. Your journey reminds me of the filmmaker... William Friedkin, mm -hmm. 
he start i i read his biography it's called the uh, friedkin connection uh, and he started almost the similar way in media and tv and then of course we all uh, saw his films and all so it's something i was uh, making a connection with <clears throat> So uh, moving on uh, to Bitcoin, of course, uh, the OG event of crypto economy. Mm-hmm. So you played a vital role in shaping it up. Uh, uh, please tell us about that. How did it come, uh, you know, to the Bitcoin that we see now, and what do you see the future of it? Yeah. So look, Bitcoin started uh, as an event, the first event really in the creator space. 2010 started by Hank and John Green, the Vlog Brothers. It was in a little basement in a hotel across the street from CAA at Century City in LA. And it was great. I, I was I sponsored the first one. I spoke at the first one. Got to know Hank and John. Helped them out in the first couple of years just as an advisor. And uh, for me, after I sold that first company, Revision Three, uh, it was our early multi-channel network in YouTube. To Discovery stayed for a couple of years. When I left, I had a non-compete, and I I couldn't go work in media for a year. But I called up Hank. I was like, Hey, want to help with that event, VidCon? And he was like, Sure, come build my industry track, which I did, and then did, ended up. Uh, building it up for Hank. Then Hank and John were like, hey, this was a couple of years later. They're like, I think we want to sell. You want to be our CEO and sell it? Because we don't want to go wherever it gets sold to and have to work there for a couple of years. And I was like, sure, why not? And so that's basically my history with VidCon. Sold it to Viacom. It's five months later, stayed there. I think, look, VidCon is an amazing snapshot of the creator economy every year in Anaheim. It does similar things around the world. And I think it's got this you know, great future of being where the creator economy comes together, creators, fans, the industry every year. And there's nothing like it. Right. So, of course, it's the biggest uh, events for creators, yeah, big, biggest event for creators. Uh, how do you see it, you know, uh, being leveraged uh, by companies like Philo, by companies like us, where we are enabling, you know, businesses that are into uh, creator data? So what do you see there? What uh, potential do you see there? Well, I think a, a couple different things. And you have to think about VidCon as a fan fest. It's a creator conference where creators learn how to become better creators. It's an industry summit where the business, you know, the business side of the industry gets together to talk about how to build even bigger businesses together. Some of them are creator led. Some like you are, uh, you know, led by entrepreneurs and, and other big companies and platforms. And so if you look at those three together, you know, is there a fan side of your business? Probably not sure, but, you know, uh, fans are there, which which brings everyone together. On the creator side, how do you think about getting in front of small, emerging, medium, and large creators, and what can they do to help your business? Is it uh, getting together and talk about what they're up to? Is it getting into the business side of the creator economy and how you can help them do that? And then, you know, that could be more of a uh, having a cocktail party or having a booth where you can help creators do what they do better. And then I think on the uh, on the industry side, it's like, how do you connect with other companies that you could perhaps partner with or sell to? And then there, it's very important. And you could, you know, you could work there, you know, definitely a sponsorship or a party sponsorship, but just meeting people and connecting with other people in the creator economy, getting ideas from other people, attending sessions, and then maybe even speaking as well. Yeah. So uh, would you say uh, creating a community of creators would work wonders for a B2B SaaS brand? It depends on how much you are focused on creators as part of your business. Like, do you need to understand more about creators and creating? That's where I think a creator group can help. But again, for creators, they're being pulled in so many different directions and there's so much going on that you'd really have to give value back to them to be able to build something like that. Yeah, got it. Now, speaking of AI, as you mentioned in your hot take, uh, AI is making waves across, you know, all platforms. Uh, do you think AI tools will be more like collaborators or competitors for human creators? Uh, I think it's going to be both. I think AI has the ability to automatically generate content or it will soon, whether it's all, it's um, synthetic creators, synthetic yeah. content created just for you. I see a world where there is so much artificial content flooding our platforms that it may be difficult for us to find content that's not. And so there's both an opportunity to threat to creators there. Certainly, I, I see it as a great collaborator to help creators do more and do better and to make good creators into great creators. I also see it as a great way for people who may want to be a creator but just don't have the, the creative power to do certain things 
to allow them to do it. So I think we're going to see a lot more creators come into the fold and create content. And I think that's a great thing globally. It also gives the opportunity for creators to be able to create in their own native language and then through video and audio and dubbing and all that, be able to reach a global audience, even those that don't speak their language. So it is both empowering, it is a tool and it is a way to help creators, but it also has the ability to generate so much junk that real creators may get buried. Yeah. Will we see an AI avatar of Jim Lauderback? Um, probably. I mean, I don't see why not. Um, I'll test it and put it out there. Um, I was talking with uh, someone from um, uh, an MCN in Asia who has some technology to be able to do that. And he was like, I want to make one of you. And then with this event in January, and I'm like, all right, well, if we do it and I'm out there, go right ahead. So who wow, knows? If it's that close, then why not? If Maybe. It's January, then- <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm just saying that that could be possible. Um, but I've got nothing against an AI avatar myself. I mean, look, I would take that and just send it out on the internet to get things done that I don't want to do. I think that'd be great. Send it off, do, do my shopping for me, you know, go out and, you know, get my groceries and pick up the, you know, pick up the dog food and, you know, hey, I didn't even have it walk the dog. Yeah, it's great. I mean, if it's that close, if it's January, because my next question was about, you know, 10 years from now on. <laughs> yeah, at some point, people, sure. How do you think people will be consuming content, uh, let's say 10 years from now on? Uh, I think it's going to be a mix of things. I think we'll still have our, you know, flat glowing rectangles that we use to look at content. But I think we're also going to have more immersive experiences where, you know, where we layer the digital and the content world on top of the existing world that we're in. And then we're going to have other times when we enter into fully realized 3D environments. I think headsets are a part of that, but I actually think headsets, you know, like the Oculus and others are transitional. If you, uh, you know, I, I still think that at some point in the future, we're going to have rooms or experiences or spaces where we can enter virtual worlds and interact with other people and go on, you know, interactive journeys and interactive stories where we're part of it, where we're in a space that's not confined with a headset, but it engages all of our senses. Is that in 10 years? Well, think about where we were 10 years ago. I mean, we hardly even had faster. iPhones yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah, I think it's going to be much earlier than 10 years, I guess. Or I yeah. hope so. Yeah, because being a film nerd, I would love to experience, you know, the already existing mediums like films uh, in a different format or different way. I don't know. Look, so, I just want my Snorlax to come with me everywhere. And if I have a little digital Snorlax that kind of sits on my shoulder like this, oh, cool. and then we go around and do our stuff. Uh, and falls asleep and falls off. But also, I'd love to play a Pokemon world where I'm in the world and I've got all these Pokemons that are in the world with me. I mean, this is an NPC, but why yeah. can't it be a fully realized NPC and have a story behind it that I can interact with? So I think that is absolutely going to come. It's going to be the future of storytelling, the future of video games. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that develop. How many Pokemons did you catch on po- Pokemon Go? I did not play Pokemon Go. Um, okay. No, not a big Pokemon Go fan because when I go outside, I want to be outside. I don't want to be staring at my phone trying to catch Pokemon. But in um, in the latest one, which is uh, Violet, I think it's Violet, um, I did, I don't know how many I, I captured. I mean, I'm never a completionist in the game. I like the game and I like going through it. But I will say, um, it's Sapphire. I don't know. This is the one that saved me. So Mamiki was my fave because I discovered it. It's relatively new, but it actually ended up being the one that was my secret weapon. So whenever I was in a battle and I was like, I got through and through and through. And then I'm like, ah, now it's time for Mamiki. Bye. And that's Thanks. basically what happened. So I like the strategy of it, not necessarily the completionist aspect of it. Okay. So Pokemon stay at home when you're outside. Nothing, uh, you know. I'd rather like be outside or- in, in nature and, 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 be part of what's around me versus trying to, you know, bring that digital, but that's me. So I'm not saying like, let's take that thought forward. Uh, If you are stranded on a deserted Island in the nature, let's say with only three tech tools allowed, what would you take with yourself? Well, I mean, the first thing I need is a satellite dish so I can connect to the internet. Right. So give me a little bit of the, the uh, whatever that thing that uh, Elon Starlink, give me Starlink. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, give me a switch. 
and give me a uh, a computer so that I can connect all those up. And uh, that's probably what I would take. It probably defeats the purpose of the question because you're like, you're all cut off. What would you take with you? It's like, no, I'd take Starlink first. Yeah. I mean, that was the whole point of the question, but yeah. I know. Okay. <laughs> all right. Rather than like the specifics of the question, let's see, what would I take with me if I got like, what kind of tech tools? Well, if I'm on a desert island and there's no power and uh, there's no internet mm-hmm. and um, I guess I need like a solar powered, I don't know, I guess. Nintendo Switch. And this Nintendo Switch and a Kindle <laughs> loaded up with every single oh, yeah. book on the world there. That's great. What are you reading nowadays? Right now I'm in the middle of an interesting uh, fantasy RPG series um, called um, Orc Economics or something like that, which is a really interesting, the, the whole, the whole um, uh, sci, uh, sci-fi fantasy lit RPG thing is really interesting. Think about an RPG game, but then telling stories in it. Uh, and then there's this one author who's really doing a good job of it. So I'm, I'm on book three. And uh, I really, really like it. And so I, I, you know, I'm reading that and, you know, and I read business books and other things on the internet. And I'm also always reading, you know, always reading what's happening currently to do my newsletter every week. But um, yeah, this, this, this fantasy RPG stuff, I think the second series I've read, it's really interesting, particularly if you're a gamer. That's nice. Uh, Besides, of course, your media expertise, uh, what other hidden talents do you have? Other hidden talents to have. I'm I'm a decent cook, which is kind of nice. I like oh, doing that. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm actually I, I um, love travel, travel, uh, travel photography, and um, just writing and sharing travel with friends. So I, if I were to come back as any sort of creator, I'd probably be a travel creator. Well, at the cost of sign- sounding trite, you're doing everything. What have you left? Are you good at sports as well? I mean, that's the only thing no. is left. No, I'm not good at sports. I can throw a frisbee okay, really God. well. How's that? Thank God you're a human being after all. Huh? I'm not a sports. I'm not really that much of a sports enthusiast. Great. I like trains. Uh, trains are cool. I can ride trains all day long. Okay. That's a great. Uh, yeah, I'm going to. So I'm going down to this, uh, speak at this conference in August called um, um, Creator Fest in Orlando. And it's a, basically for creators that are uh, that uh, teaching them to be entrepreneurs. And Florida in the summer is not really a great place to go. Um, but I'm going in part because I want to go to the event. But the other mm-hmm. thing is we just created here in the US like maybe our first or second real high-speed train that goes faster than cars. It's called Brightline and it goes from Miami to Orlando. So I'm like, nice. I'm going down um, a little early so I can land in Miami and then take the bright line to Orlando because I want to ride on this fast train in the U.S. Because we, beside the Acela right now, that's all we got. Yeah, that's good. I mean, something new, I guess, for U.S. citizens. Because trains, it's, U.S. is not known for trains, right? So No, no. And we have, we have decent trains, but they're slow. Now, over time, that's going to change because Brightline that's building the one in Florida is also building one to go from L.A. to Las Vegas, which is super smart. So that'll be up in a couple of years. And then here, like I live just south of San Francisco, and they are slowly building the fast train from San Francisco to L.A. So I think we will have more, but it's never going to be like Spain or France or, you know, China or other parts yeah, of the world. Japan. Or Japan. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Trains in Japan are so cool. Yeah, so fast. Uh, coming back to influencer marketing now. Uh, oh, yeah, that's what we're talking now. about. <laughs> yeah, coming to the boring stuff again. Uh, given your decades-long experience witnessing the evolution of creator economy and influencer marketing, how do you see API solutions like us playing a role in streamlining the workflow for both creators as well as brands that are, want to work with each other? So I, I think this is a really interesting question because first of all there's a lot of data out there in different spaces and sources that need to be uh, sort of brought together but i also kind of look at it from an ai perspective and i think as we move forward with ai we're going to need a middleware layer that connects the different models that we have so you may have an expensive model like chat gpt4 or 5 i may have my personal model my personal llm with all my personal data that's stored in a secure place probably at my house if it's me uh, I'm going to have lower cost models, one that might be really good at marketing material, one that might be really good at travel planning. And I'm going to want to have some sort of um, middleware or agent of my own 
that when I tell it what I want, it says, well, I need a little bit of the expensive one over here. I need a little bit of this other one over here. And I'm going to dig into your personal one that's located here to pull this out. And then I'm going to go over there and I'm going to pull all that together for you. And so I think that, you know, a lot of people are like API, but that middleware that can connect all those together, I think is going to be a really important part of our AI future. And then on top of that, I just, I think it's, I, I think building that layer that can pull that together is is going to save us all a lot of money too. And I just, so anyway, and for creators, the ability to do all of that and pull that together, whether you're a person or a creator or whatever, that being able to pull all that together to understand what you need and not spend, you know, an incredible amount of money on AI, but also not get a lot of crap from AI either. I think all of those are going to be super important. It's great. Uh, beyond follower count, what are some of the key factors creators should focus on to build a lasting and authentic brand? You know, focus on who you are and what you like. I mean, follower count is almost not even relevant anymore. I mean, it's totally relevant, but there are other things like how many known fans do you have? How many fans of yours do you know? Do you have direct mm. connection to? Can you market directly to? Whether it's through email address or mobile number or whatever. What sort of, you know, what, what, kind of content are you making that you like? How is that resonating with people? How are you enjoying it? Because in the end, if you're not enjoying the content creator journey, it's going to drive you crazy and you're going to have mental health issues. So all of those things I think are important beyond followers where you think about what makes me unique? What do I like? And how do I build a unique connection with my audience? Because more and more we're finding that smaller creators who go deep on a niche and are really focusing on something that's important to them and that they're passionate about actually have more value to brands than somebody who's just a broad, not a huge, but a broad level creator with 10 or 20 million followers. I've been hearing more and more about the sort of, you know, the, the, there's power in the smaller areas of content versus being like this big of a creator. Now, certainly if you're Mark Rober, Mr. Beast, uh, Rhett and yeah. Link, et cetera, you're okay and you're fine, but at that there's there's a middle squeeze that I think is happening. And so how do you make sure you're doing what you're passionate about and you know it and you're connecting with your core super fans so that you can connect with them and build something together with them that you can then go out and either sell that access to brands or build your own thing and sell to them. Great. Uh, Jim, you're also a creator. You're a LinkedIn creator. And not just LinkedIn creator, you have your own newsletter, which is like going strong uh, inside the creator economy, of course. So uh, what are the top three, let's say, life lessons that have come out for you in this journey of creating inside the creator economy? I think creating in general, it's just do what you like. And accidentally, you may end up where I'm at now. I mean, look, my, my newsletter is almost at 30,000, which is amazing. Um, and it started by accident. I mean, I, you know, we, I was at VidCon, uh, running VidCon. It was COVID. We were coming out of COVID. We had database of all of our industry folks. We wanted them to start to come back to the events again. So we, you know, we'd send them out an email. We're like, you know, you know, like, I don't know how many thousands of people it was. And I was like, hey, come back, buy tickets. And, you know, our open rate wasn't so good. And as I was talking to our head of marketing, I was like, why don't I just put a couple of stories in there every week so that there's some content so people want to open it. And I'd done this in the past when I was at PC Magazine on a, a computer-based newsletter called What's New Now. I'm like, I know how to do it. It's pretty easy. So I started doing that. And just a couple months later, LinkedIn, which I was on LinkedIn really early because I was running PC Magazine when Reid Hoffman came out and was showing it off before it launched. So I was like user 8,000 of LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn launched their newsletter property. And I was like, well, I'll take this thing I'm doing for VidCon and just shove it up there. I'll get more people to read it, which is what we wanted. And it kind of took on a life of its own. And when I left VidCon and I left Viacom, I kept my newsletter on my own LinkedIn account because it was my account. And that is what is now a 30,000 almost person follower newsletter today. So it's accidental, but it works. So don't be afraid of accidentally jumping into something and then rolling with it when it, when it starts to take off. That And that sounds so counterintuitive, right? We think that there is concrete method to everything that we build, but... <laughs> but I had no plan. I had no plan to do this. 
just amazing uh, jim a couple of rituals that we make our guests th- go through at the end of the interviews we ask them what they're reading which you have already told us the second one is would you like to nominate anyone for a show nominate anyone for a show let's see uh you know you should talk there's a bunch of people you should talk to um i think renee teely is great rachel masters is great leslie morgan is great um you know if you think about others like the thing that um brendan gone is doing with influencer authority is or with creator authority is great it's a b2b um it's a, a b2b influencer agency on linkedin super interesting um there's a lot of people i would recommend but i think that you know all of them have great stories to tell wonderful uh, jim lauderback thank you so much for coming to the show it's been a pleasure uh having you here it's been a pleasure following you on linkedin learning from you i've been a reader of inside the creator economy mm-hmm. and uh we hope you continue to do it and uh we look up to you uh so so yeah that's thank you great thank you thank you, you. i'm oh, i'm going to continue to do it you should all subscribe on linkedin or on beehive now cuz i'm on beehive so oh, inside I the creator economy and um i love what you're doing too so thank you so much for having me on Thank you so much and if you have any feedback for us please reach out to Jim on LinkedIn he is the, is everywhere practically <laughs> uh, or you can simply you know comment in the comment section and uh, we'll let Jim know uh, what we uh, what we what you think of him or his work so thanks again Jim uh, see you at Vidcon the next one i think will be there as well so yeah see you at the next Vidcon probably web summit probably the 1 billion followers summit definitely nab and um more places to come absolutely thank you so much i thank you i impulse the influencer marketing podcast is brought to you by philo philo is the easiest way to get access to authenticated creator data from hundreds of different platforms to know more about philo visit getphilo.com that's get p h y l l o dot com also make sure to search for influencer marketing podcast in apple podcast spotify google podcast or any of your favorite podcast listening platforms and don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes on behalf of the team here at philo thank you so much for listening